Hello, this is Dennis Polis. Welcome to another in the series of Open Philosophy videos. In this video, we will be considering the mind-body problem, which is, how can an immaterial mind control physical movement? Last time, we saw that the scientific method, which is modeled on physics as a paradigm, focuses on the objects in nature to the exclusion of the knowing subject. Thus, when it is applied to mind, which is the center of our subjectivity, all data relevant to subjectivity, awareness, and intentionality has been filtered out. Thus, there is no data available to naturalists to build a complete model of mind. In order to remedy this deficiency, we have to add to the model developed by neuroscience a subsystem supporting awareness and intentionality. The result is a two-subsystem theory of mind. We have a data processing subsystem, which is basically the brain, and an intentional subsystem. The brain supports brain states and, of course, data processing, while the intentional subsystem supports everything that has to do with intentionality. We approach them in different ways. Neuroscience studies the brain, and introspection studies the intentional subsystem. The data processing subsystem gets its input from sensation, and our intentional subsystem gets its input from awareness of encoded contents. The data processing subsystem outputs motor impulses which control our behavior, while the intentional subsystem outputs willed acts or committed intentions. The information in the brain is encoded in neural structures, while the information in the intentional subsystem is in our thought. René Descartes lived in an era when physics was just becoming an independent science. He saw that physics was inadequate to explain the phenomenon of mind, but unfortunately the theory he developed as an alternative, Cartesian dualism, has major problems. Descartes divided the world into res extensa, or extended stuff, matter, and res cogitans, or thinking stuff, mind. Of course, res extensa, being matter, supports all physical processes, and res cogitan, being mind, supports all thought processes. This is very different from the two-subsystem mind theory that I've been outlining, because the two-subsystem mind includes physical processes. Cartesian dualism has two problems. One was recognized long ago. It is that res cogitans, being unphysical, has no way to grasp the levers of power in the brain, so it can't affect physical movements. This is called the mind-body problem. The second problem is that thinking depends on the brain. This was known to Thomas Aquinas, who had observed that head injuries impair thinking. But Descartes did not give a role to the brain in thought. Thus, the Cartesian model is false, and if the only two choices are the Cartesian model or naturalism, naturalism wins by default. The two-subsystem mind, however, presents a third option. Since naturalism has no model for our subjective awareness or intentionality, we can rule it out as well. How does the two-subsystem mind deal with the problem of being unable to pull the levers of power? Here is where the investment that we made in studying the laws of nature begins to pay dividends. The standard and accepted analysis of intentionality is due to Franz Brentano, who derived it from his training in scholastic philosophy. Brentano notes that every intention is about something. Knowing, willing, hoping, believing, each is about something. We will to do a certain thing, we know a certain content, we hope for a certain outcome. Accordingly, it is generally accepted that the defining characteristic of intentions is their aboutness. They all have some content they are about. So, we may ask, are the laws of nature about anything? And the answer is clearly yes. The law of conservation is about conserving energy. The law of gravity is about how objects are drawn toward each other in virtue of their mass, and so on. So, by the standard analysis of intentionality as aboutness, the laws of nature are definitely intentional. 
there is another and more specific way in which the laws of nature may be said to be intentional. They and human committed intentions are both species of what we may call logical propagators. To understand what this means, we need to consider what makes a syllogism valid. For a syllogism to be valid, both of its premises need to be true at the same time. It does no good for one premise to be true at one time and the other to be true at a different time. Suppose that we argue that all in the room now can hear Mary and that John will be in the room tomorrow and we conclude John can hear Mary. Obviously this is invalid because of the temporal mismatch. Being in the room tomorrow is not the same as being in the room today. So unless both premises are true at the same time, our conclusion is invalid. Still, we can make predictions. The reason for this is that some propositions have the special property of carrying information forward in time. Such propositions are what I'm calling illogical propagators. Consider, for example, the following valid line of reasoning. All in the room when Mary speaks can hear her. Mary now intends to speak in the room tomorrow. John will be in the room tomorrow. John can hear Mary tomorrow. What allows this reasoning to be valid is the fact that Mary now intends to speak in the room tomorrow. This proposition carries information from today into tomorrow and is what I'm calling a logical propagator. There are only two examples of logical propagators that I can think of. The first is committed human intentions, like Mary's intention to speak tomorrow, and the second is the laws of nature, which allow us to use information on the present state of a system to predict its future state. Thus, committed human intentions and the laws of nature are generically similar, being the only two species in the genus of logical propagators. We may conclude that not only are the laws of nature intentional, because they meet Brentano's test for intentionality, but also they are generically the same kind of intention as human committed intentions. Naturalists argue that human intentions can't control motions because motions are completely determined by the laws of nature. While this might be true, it begs the question because naturalists assume that the laws of nature are the same as the laws of physics. But of course we know that they aren't. The laws of physics are simply approximations to the laws of nature. Since the general laws of nature and human intentions are both intentional, might it not be possible for human intentions to modify the laws of nature? If this were so, our intentions would operate in the intentional theater of operations and not have to exert forces on atoms and molecules, but simply perturb the laws of physics. While non-physicists are generally unaware of it, most of the calculations in advanced physics are done using perturbation theory. That means that the general laws are solved exactly, but then the interactions of interest are treated approximately by perturbing or tweaking the general solution. It would not be a radical departure to treat human intentions in the same way as perturbations that tweak the general solutions enough to cause our behavior. Is there any evidence to show that this is possible or that it actually happens? Years of parapsychological research have shown small but statistically significant psychokinetic effects. Dean Radden and Roger Nelson reviewed 832 experiments by 68 investigators in which subjects were asked to control random number generators, typically driven by radioactive decay. They subjected the results to meta-analysis a method for combining data from many experiments. While the control run showed no significant effect, the mean effect of subjects trying to influence the outcome was 32 in 100,000 cases. The odds of this being due to random variation is 1 in 24,000. Radden and Diane C. Ferrari analyzed 152 studies of dice throwing by 52 different investigators involving 2,592,817 throws and found an effect size of 7 per thousand. The odds of this being due to random variation is 1 in 2 times 10 to the 73rd power. 
In 2003, Radden and Nelson updated their 1989 work by adding 84 studies missed earlier and 92 studies published from 1987 to mid-2000. This gave 515 experiments by 91 different principal investigators with a total of 1.4 billion random numbers. This is fewer experiments than they had in their original study because they took 258 experiments from the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Laboratory and collapsed them into a single data point. Their analysis showed an effect size of 7 parts in 1,000 with odds of 3.92 times 10 to the 57th to 1 against this effect being random. Robert John, an engineering professor at Princeton, reported on a 12-year study with 100 subjects and 2,497,200 trials. He used a commercial noise generator to produce random numbers and asked the subjects to control them. His results were similar to what we've seen with about 1 bit in 10,000 controlled and with the odds against this being due to randomness being about 35 trillion to 1. All of these results are much higher than the level set by Victor Stenger in his book God the Failed Hypothesis. There he arbitrarily sets odds of 10,000 to 1 for a result to qualify as scientific. One criticism of meta-analysis is that studies with no significant effect are more likely to be filed away than published. This is called the file drawer effect. We can estimate how likely this is to reduce a significant effect to insignificance by calculating how many additional unpublished studies showing no effect would be required to reduce the results to insignificance. For dice throw, almost 18,000 unpublished studies with no results would be required. For Radden and Nelson's 2003 meta-analysis, almost 11 million file drawer studies would be required. Thus, we can be confident that the mind can exert intentional control over the laws of nature, with the effect being about one part in 10,000. One part in 10,000 doesn't seem like a very large effect. However, the brain contains 10 to the 11th neurons. Thus, an effect of one part in 10,000 corresponds to controlling 10 million neurons. Given that the brain has evolved as a control system, and that the nature of control systems is to use small inputs to control large outputs, this is more than adequate to control our body and behavior. Next time we will consider the case against intentional control, or for physical determinism. Thank you for your time and attention. Please leave comments.